Most of you may be listening to this video using some headphones, or maybe even a pair of speakers. And most of the time, that music signal comes from an audio jack. A problem arises though when you start using bigger and bigger music systems, because the audio line from your computer or phone is just too low power and is only a couple of volts peak to peak. This is not enough to run, say, a 21 speaker. Well, that's where amplifiers come into play. They allow us to amplify the voltage and power our weak audio signals so that we can play music as loudly as we would want. But how do said amplifiers work? Well, in this video, we'll find out for ourselves, so stay tuned. To learn more about speaker amplification, I needed a pair of donor speakers that I would be okay with if I ended up breaking them. So I went down to Goodwill and found these. It's hard to say what brand they are exactly, but they will do the trick. And after taking them back, I immediately got the testing. Also, don't mind the change in environment. I made this video while I'm at university, which I would say is lacking in tools. Anyways, the first thing that we should do is make sure that the speakers actually work before I tear them open. So I plugged the power cord in and the audio jack into my computer. The good news is that they actually do work, although they are a bit on the quiet side. On the front panel, there are two knobs, volume and bass. There are also two extra audio jacks for convenience as well. And finally, there was a power switch on the back. But enough with the outside, let's get inside of this thing. I started with a secondary speaker, since it was lighter and the most likely to be holding fewer things that I could possibly damage when opening it for the first time. At first, I thought there would have been screws underneath these rubber feet, but there wasn't anything underneath those. In fact, there weren't any screws on here anywhere, so getting in was going to be difficult. These sheet products are really annoying with their almost unopenable cases. We do get a view from the inside from the hole in the back, but that didn't really reveal anything useful. So, I got out a screwdriver to try and pry the front off. Maybe it was just made out of glue. I eventually ended up poking a hole in the top of the case, but still nothing would budge. But while rummaging through random tool chests, I found this so-called hot knife. And man, did I wish I had discovered this sooner. It melts right through the plastic on the case like it's butter. Just try to stay away from the fumes. And yes, I realize that this is completely destroying the case. But this is more of a research project than anything else. The parts will end up being scrapped. Anyways, I ended up going all the way around the entire case using this hot knife. But still nothing was moving. That made me realize that there might be some sort of internal screw system or something holding it together. So I cut open this square at the top to get a better view of what was inside. And as I finally realized, there were six holes holding the back into the front. I tried to simply melt through them, but found that there was something metallic in the way. I then proceeded to cut open another hole to get better access to the pole. I used these admittedly overkill cutters to break through the remaining support. Unknowingly enough, there were screws inside of these poles. If the manufacturer had just exposed them, all I would have had to do was just unscrew everything instead of having to perform surgery on this thing. Anyways, after cutting through all six poles, we have opened up this secondary speaker set. And unsurprisingly, there's only one speaker in here, nothing else. To get to the actual point of this video, I moved on to the main speaker. The process was a lot smoother this time because I knew exactly where I should cut. Although I did end up making one big mistake, which I'll reveal to you later on. There's a lot more stuff in here this time, so let's go over everything. The power cord feeds directly into a transformer, the output of which leads directly back to the board. Based on an initial observation, I'm willing to bet that it leads to these four diodes, which form a full bridge rectifier. There are quite a few electrolytic capacitors on the top of the PCB. Unfortunately though, the IC has no marking on it that I can read to get some sort of data sheet. And there's a considerably large heat sink over it. And on the bottom of the PCB, there are several SMD resistors and capacitors. And this is where I made my mistake. While using the hot knife, I mistakenly hit a resistor and a capacitor. Now normally this wouldn't be a big deal, but the tools here are not at all equipped to do SMD soldering. So these two tiny components essentially ended up ending the speaker. But don't worry though, I'll bring it back home and recycle it for future videos. Anyways, let's get to the technical part where I tell you how the speaker transforms our weak phone signal and turns up the volume. This is done through a process called amplification. And there are several different types of audio amplifiers, and they are named using the letters of the alphabet. Today, we'll focus on the Class A amplifier, since I believe that it is the one used in our speakers, simply due to the low par count and the huge heat sink. For your own personal knowledge though, the other two most widely used amplifiers are the Class AB and the Class D amplifiers, but more on those two in the future videos. 
Class A amplifiers are defined by their use of only one transistor to handle the entire audio signal. Here's the schematic of the most simple Class A amplifier, just a transistor and a resistor. Without the resistor, there would be no voltage drop between the positive power rail and the output. So the resistor simply drops the correct amount of voltage. The voltage that is dropped is determined by the current flowing through it, and the current flowing through it is determined by the NPN transistor. So how do we draw the correct amount of current from our transistor? Well, remember that BJT transistors amplify the current by a specific value, depending on the transistor. So, in our case, if we have a 2N3904 transistor with an amplification factor of 300, the current flowing through the collector to the emitter would be 300 times greater than the current flowing through the base to the emitter. And I think you'll agree that the input voltage is directly proportional to the current that it creates. This essentially creates an amplified copy of the original on the output. The problem with this design right now is that most transistors have a gain that is much too high to be useful for audio applications. And that's where we can add a second resistor to the bottom. This resistor will decrease the amount of current that the input voltage will create. And this essentially adds a dividing factor to the current amplification. Not too bad, but there's still a couple of problems. The first is the base to emitter voltage drop of 0.7 volts. This is a problem for the lower input voltages since when they are below that threshold, they are unable to properly drive the transistor. To solve this, most designs incorporate a couple of resistors in a voltage divider configuration. This simply adds a DC offset to the input signal so that it stays above the 0.7 volts that we just talked about. And that is the basic design of a Class A amplifier. I recommend that you add capacitors along the inputs and outputs in order to remove any parasitic DC that is stuck inside of the signals. The biggest disadvantage to this type of amplifier is its inefficiency. That's why it often needs heat sinks. I realize that all of this conceptual stuff isn't always the most useful, so I do recommend this PDF guide that confers how you can select values for your own amplifier. The link for it will be in the description. Anyways, while we are done with the Class A amplifier, I'm sure some of you are still curious about the aforementioned base knob. The explanation behind it is really quite simple. First of all, you should stop thinking base boost and instead think of treble reduction, wherein the base is kept the same and all the higher frequencies are instead diminished. Two components are capable of achieving the behavior that I'm talking about, the capacitor and the inductor. Since capacitors are much more practical to use inside of circuits, we'll focus on those instead of inductors. You may or may not be familiar with capacitive reactants, but the basic idea is that a capacitor acts like a different valve resistor depending on the input frequency. The equation for this reactant is one divided by two pi frequency capacitance, where F is the frequency in Hertz and C is the capacitance of the capacitor in farads. You will notice that at higher frequencies, the reactant starts becoming smaller and smaller. We can use this to our advantage and construct a low pass filter. Think of this low pass filter as a voltage divider. At high frequencies, the capacitor acts like a small resistor, being that most of the voltage is dropped through our normal resistor. But when the frequency is low, the capacitor's reactance is large, which means the voltage is instead dropped over the capacitor, which keeps the signal line's voltage higher. Keep in mind that all of these frequencies can be present at the same time, such as in music. So using this method, we have essentially lowered the higher frequencies while keeping the lower frequencies, the bass. Anyways, that should do it for our inspection of these speakers. And since I don't really have plans to revive this thing, I will be scrapping it for parts. So keep an eye out for these pieces in future videos. Well, if you enjoyed this video and learned something new, please consider subscribing so you can see my future videos. Have a good one!